All righty, so welcome back everyone. Here on track two, we are having an hour panel discussion on dealing with behavioral issues hosted by Corey Janke from Huntington Society of Canada. We are delighted to have our panel speakers, Anne Elizabeth, Mackenzie and Zainab. The format here will be that Corey will start with a few words and then each panelist will have time to share their experience and then we welcome time for questions. Please feel free to use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. As a reminder, HD has no borders, so we are excited to bring the international panel together for our common goal. This session is being recorded that you can share with friends and family later or even watch it back. And on that note, I welcome you all and I will pass you over to Corey. Corey, you're on mute. Welcome guys and uh, thanks for coming into our session today. As you know, HD is a complex and multifaceted disease. The neurological changes that occur in the brain as a result of HD alters personality and mood, often resulting in unfamiliar and at times very challenging behaviors. These behavioral changes can be scary and at times embarrassing. Consequently, many suffer in silence while they adapt to the loss of their loved ones. Without expression or acknowledgement, many often feel alone, misunderstood and isolated. Today, we are so pleased to have three brave individuals from various parts of our world who will share their unique story with us to begin a discussion about the challenges and the beliefs and or feelings that they have or had as they continue on with their journey with HD. So welcome. And who would like to start? Zainab, would that be okay? Yes, I can start. Thank you. Uh, uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Zainab. I live in Moscow, but originally I'm from the southern part of Russia. Uh, I have seen my granny, uh, father, aunt and sister with HD. I also have cousins at risk of HD. It took a long time before I could understand it when and how HD is acting in a person. I want to talk about my experience with my father. My father was a very intelligent person, a promising neighbor surgeon, but I can hardly remember happy days with my father. With my sister and me, he was cold and a closed person. But my relatives told me that he was very kind and easy person in a younger age, the best friend and a person with a great sense of humor. I never felt his love, but relatives told me that he loved my sister and me most in the world. He just couldn't express his feelings in any way. Over time, I realized that it was a manifest manifestation of the disease, behavioral changes. Uh, now it is too late to stop being afraid of his coldness and simply come and hug him tight. I was afraid of him and I was always very distant from him. At that time, genetic testing wasn't available in Russia um, and the risk of HD apparently pressed on my father as he witnessed his mother's hyperkinesia and psychosis. I can only imagine what was on his mind. Uh, the topic of HD was forbidden in our family, in the family of doctors where every day in the evenings medical cases were discussed, but not HD. HD kept us in fear, silent fear. Dad had no one to discuss this topic with but he found his salvation in alcohol. He drank very often. And when he was drunk, he became aggressive towards my mom. He quarreled more and more often with mom and grandfather. I hated him for that and didn't understand the cause of such behavior. I also never invited my friends to my place as I was ashamed of my father, his awkward movements, his drunk behavior, his sudden phrases, uh, the tension in the family increased and the atmosphere became more and more uncomfortable. Later on, I understood that it was HD to blame. Father was quite alone in his, in his worries and his thoughts. I was thinking about committing suicide. One day, uh, dad attacked my mom with a knife because he wanted to protect me from her, as he told me. He beat at her and I tried to stop him. He also accused her of being unfaithful to him. 
That was the worst day in my life. That very day, Dad was forced to go to the psychiatric clinic where he was tied to the bed and spent two months. And when he came home, he was never the same again. He was treated with the medications that suppressed his nervous system and suppressed emotion, emotional willpower sphere. Of course, all these, I have regrets about all this now. Uh, for many years, I had nightmares about my father. Uh, and for many years till now, I regret I didn't know about HD more to understand my father better, to hug him tight, to say that I loved him. Uh, for now, I have been volunteering for the Russian HD community for more than five years. And having attended different HD meetings and conferences, having learned so much about HD from the world top experts, I want to share my thoughts and maybe give some advice that I follow myself to. As uh, I learned uh, from the uh, British uh, scientists, MRI of HD brain shows that there is a constant striatum loss during HD happening. What is striatum? It is the part of the brain that controls our movements, our executive function, that means that is responsible for planning of our daily activities and social cognitive function that helps us to recognize what other people feel. And when we know the organic reason for the changes in a person with HD, it helps us to explain behavioral changes. So what are the tips and, um, that I use in my life and um, <clears throat> when I address my sister with HD, which is in her late stage of HD. First is uh, to distinguish a personality from the disease. What does it mean? Um, I try to remember my sister um, before HD started. It is difficult sometimes to understand when HD started, but you can see changes. Nobody, usually nobody wants to be rude, cranky or aggressive. If this happens, this is the sign that it could be caused by, the, by HD. And you must understand that the person with HD doesn't want it to happen, but cannot control it or has difficulties in controlling it, or sometimes doesn't realize it. The second one is hurry up and wait. Many of you might know that it is the name of the popular book about HD written by Jimmy Pollard. What does it mean? We must be quick with our, um, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Get lost a bit. Um, we must be quick um, with a person with HD as they usually have higher demands when asking for something. And at the same time, we must wait giving him or her time to process the information and give the answer back. Third is remember that a person with HD has lower energy capacity and gets tired more faster than a healthy person. That is why a thorough planning of any activity should be considered. The place where a person with HD can have rest or quiet, not noisy, noisy place should be considered. If there is no such place, the fatigue of a person with HD can lead to irritability and anxiety and accordingly to a deviant or strange behavior. The fourth is to try to understand what caused irritability or anxiety. The reasons can be very plain and simple. Uh, this can be hunger, thirst, temperature of environment, too high or too low, the level of noise, um, multitasking, which is difficult for a person with HD, lack of sleep. And uh, we, we must try to prompt and encourage social and physical activities that should be adapted to the person with HD. So um, I, hope, <laughs> I hope you are not um, sad with my story <laughs> because I feel very positive because I look forward to the best in our life of HD community. We are on the border of great discoveries in HD research. But um, what I would like to say is to for all these years, I understood that HD, um, we can be happy and try to, to make our lives better living with HD.
Thank you. Thank you, Zainab, so much for that uh, moving story uh, about your experience with HD so far in your life. Um, Matt, are you okay to go next? Yeah, for sure. Um, so I'm from Canada. So I've known Corey for a bit, so he knows a little bit about my story as well. Um, so I've grown up basically since the day I can remember, I've been involved with uh, HD. Um, I was growing up, first thing, memory of my aunt is late stages, um, Huntington's. Um, so she was in a wheelchair, um, lots of Korea, was un unable to speak because of the meds to control her movements and such. Um, so she was very well near the end stages. And uh, so I had known the end stages very well growing up. I had seen that with my aunt. And so she passed away when I was about seven or eight years old. And then a couple of years later, um, my parents uh, were, we were outside with my parents and my parents decided that they were going to tell my sister and I that my mom was gene positive and beginning to become symptomatic. Um, so at a young age, I had seen all the negative and bad parts of HD near the end that it was definitely a lot scarier because I hadn't experienced the beginning because I was so young when my aunt had. Um, so growing up, I, I, I kind of had it backwards to most people where they experienced the beginning to the end. I kind of experienced the end and to the beginning with my mom. Um, so I was very quiet growing up talking about it. The only people I really talked about it to was my, um, my family. And then um, kind of when I was told about Huntington's disease with my mom having it, um, everything kind of changed. I began to get more involved. Uh, my family began to get more involved. We had already been participating every year at the annual uh, fundraiser held in Winnipeg, the Indie Go-Kart Challenge uh, in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. Um, but now at this point, I realized I wanted to get more involved and learn more about Huntington's. Um, so from that point on, um, I dove right in to learn more and I, um, I attended multiple uh, conferences with the Huntington Society of Canada um, and then if we fast forward to, to today almost 10 years later from finding out about uh, my mom having Huntington's um, I've attended multiple conferences uh, youth days for the YPAD chapter in Canada um, and HDYO North American camp I'm also in a mentorship program with the HSC Huntington Society of Canada um, as a mentor and a mentee getting support and giving support. I'm um, also an HDYO ambassador and um, I just, I've, I hold multiple volunteer roles on different chapters um, across Canada. So I've just been super involved and I hope to share my experience and tips uh, for dealing with behavioral issues with uh, Huntington's and caregiving for that with you today. Awesome, thanks Mac. Um, Annie, you're on. Hello, everyone. My name is Annie. Uh, I was born in Sweden. I'm currently living in Colombia because that's where my family's at and that's where I'm working and studying at the moment. Uh, I was born into a Huntington family. My grandfather had it, but he, my father was 20 years old when he passed away, so I didn't have the opportunity to meet him. But when I was born, my uncle was already in the early to mid stages. And when I was around five, six years old, my dad started showing symptoms as well. And uh, my mom and I already noticed that there was something weird, but sadly, well, he didn't get tested until I was 10 years old. I've been a caregiver for my father since I was eight years old until I was 22. Even though he was in care homes and everything, I was mostly one in the end taking, taking care of him because the issue, as you might know, is that not every care that is out there knows about HD. So you still have to work somehow. Um, I'm an HDO ambassador. I am also involved with the European Huntington Association and the Swedish Huntington Association. So, and I've been involved since I was then because what I've learned with all of this is that you, if you're more educated about the disease, it will be easier to understand it as well as not feeling alone. The first thing I discovered with my father when it comes to HD was 
what we're going to talk about in this panel, which is behavioral issues. Uh, when I was a kid, my dad was a very, very happy man. He was very kind to me, very loving. And I have a lot of fun memories with him because he was like a big brother to me. He was my best friend and we did everything together. So it was really rough starting school and at the same time noticing that his behavioral changes were a bit extreme, like for a kid to not know what's going on because he was getting angry. He was getting irritated by my actions. And, you know, when you're a kid, you're very, well, you're, you're very talkative, you're very happy, you walk and run around. And he was used to that before, but when, when the symptoms started to show, he had no time to like really process it. He just got angry with me all the time. And I thought it was because of me as a kid, because when you're a kid, you think mostly that, oh, if your parents change behavior, it means that you've done something wrong. And since nobody talked to me about HD until I was 10 years old, I, I really thought it was something that I did uh, that caused my uncle to get bad and my dad to get angry and later on as well. The family situation in general was caused by things that I did. So I was walking on eggshells with his behavioral issues. So we're going to talk more about it in this panel, but that's one of the first things that me and my mother discovered my dad and that has to be honest affected me a lot because in the case of Mackenzie and Zainab, um it's it's really rough it's really rough and it affects you uh, as a person as well it's not about someone just getting angry or ir irritated by you it's uh, the way of living with that uh, and that environment in general it really affects you mentally and in other ways as well uh, which is in a way very bad if you don't have, in my case, the, the help that you actually deserve and the information that you deserve to learn how to cope with it. So we, in this panel, are also going to talk about that, how, how to cope with it, how to understand the behavioral issues in Huntington's disease. And just like Sina said, how to make negative things uh, with the symptoms go positive for us so we can actually move on with our lives. So yeah, thank you all for listening. Thank you so much, Annie. Uh, and thank you, Zainab and Mac as well for sharing your stories with us. I'm sure that uh, with the three different stories, there are some similarities that I'm sure people that are listening now and later will be able to connect with and uh, appreciate and respect what it is that you're talking about. So we're gonna um, open the floor up for some discussion from uh, the groups that are watching. But in the meanwhile, just to kind of keep the conversation going, um, we've got some questions prepared and I'm gonna throw them back at uh, the three of you just to have some start, starting of the conversation. Um, you did express uh, some of the behaviors that you witnessed your loved one experience uh, as the HD uh, started to progress. Um, how did those behaviors start to affect your relationship with that loved one? Well, I can start. So, so we have something to work on. My mind was very complicated because since I, I do have a memory of my dad being a, a very happy, loving, caring person, and then him going to the other extreme side, which in, in the similar case of Sena, he started drinking, getting very aggressive, um, getting irritated and punching walls, screaming, swearing and all of that. It was really hard for me because in one way, I just wanted to cut my relationship with my father and never know anything about him. But at the same time, I had to realize this is the deceased talking and that's not really who he is as a person because I do have evidence about it. But it's so frustrating because when you receive those punches, like when they, they start screaming, when they start yelling, when they start not having any appetite to do anything, and you have to 
work through that. It's not easy and it's, it's complicated because being a caregiver as well, you start having a very sad relationship, which is caregiver and not father-daughter or mother-son and so on. Uh, and it's sad because you, I had a very, I'm that kind of person that I started suppressing my anger because of my dad's way of expressing it, it scared me so much that I was scared of showing my anger so I had to accept it and just let it go through me. And whenever he was angry, I was scared to stand up for myself and such. And I didn't know what to do in any way. And I was also angry inside as a teenager because, hey, my dad isn't my dad. I, I'm only taking care of him. He's only screaming at me. He's not loving me. He's not showing any interest that that hey thank you for helping me out thank you thank you for being there when no one else is for me there was no such thing so you were really like angry about the situation and at the same time you really wanted to kind of run away from it um but when he, my dad was in the late stages he actually started like having more apathy but the anger issues and such actually were were getting better for some reason i don't know why but it was good because when he was at the care home and everything that's when he actually was happy and then we, we started having a normal relationship i came to visit him but instead of being that what do you need what do you want for help it was finally something like oh hey how are you doing that oh fine do you want to play with you with me or do you want to listen to rock music with me and then we would sit and he would be happy about it. And that's one thing that actually amazed me. Like you have to be so patient with someone with HD, especially if they show symptoms of behavioral issues because that, yes, they're very heavy, very heavy for a lot of us. But when you, now that I'm, my father passed away two years ago, and now that I had like two, three years with him, where our relationship was finally father and daughter, I actually, now I don't even regret it, like the being there for him and everything. And I've appreciated the times that I've actually had to have that relationship and that where then there were no screaming, where we were only together watching football watching hockey, listen to music, and, and you start missing it. So it's something that for everyone out there, like even if the relationship is very heavy, you might get, have, you might have some mental issues in my case, like anxiety and such. It's still good because when you finally start understanding Huntington's disease in a way, you're happy that you actually managed to have a relationship with your father and it finally like, Oh, I, I I understand him now. Like I finally get the the difference between Huntington's disease and my own father, and being able to focus on what's good about my father and what he has done or had tried to do uh, to improve our relationship. Because sometimes we ignore those small things. It can be such a tiny thing, just as just hugging them once or them smiling even when they're deteriorated and my dad managed to smile when he saw me, just those tiny things value those a lot to make the situation a bit and better. Thank you so much. Thank you so no much. Problem. I'm so happy that you had the opportunity to kind of uh, find some peace in your relationship with your dad. Mac, I think you wanted to go next. Um, yeah, so um, I mean, I had a little bit of a different experience because um, my mom, as when when she started getting symptomatic both my sister and I were starting to become teenagers and she wasn't oh she wasn't angry towards me me and my mom always had this special connection but I got this special role almost of I was basically the only one that was able to talk my mom down when she was angry or she was picking fights with my uh, sister and my dad um, a lot of the time she would clash heads with my sister on stuff like my sister might ask her to do something and my mom just doesn't feel like doing it. So she kind of gets angry and she snaps at her. And then there's a fight. My role um, in the family was kind of the only one that could 
talk them down and stop and kind of fix these problems and these solutions. So kind of felt like 24 seven, I was on this role of kind of like being the police around the house so that there was no problems going on, um, making sure that everyone was happy and kind of um, made my role with my mom kind of more like I was the parent and she was the kid. And so at a very young age, it was kind of uh, difficult to cope with that because um, I'm I'm the one growing up and I don't have my mom to treat me like she's my mom. Like I don't have that mom figure as much as other people do because she's sick and I'm the one that's taking care of her. So I feel more and more like the parent. And then I'm trying to fight these uh, fights from happening and trying to calm them down. So um, it kind of made me have to grow up a little bit faster dealing with my mom and caregiving for her. So um, I didn't get the brunt of all of her anger when she was angry and stuff. My my dad and my sister did, but I had this weird role of like almost the parent of my of my mom. So um, it was it was definitely changed how I reacted with my mom. Um, it's it's always weird dealing with the fact that I'm kind of being the parent to my mom and I'm taking care of her and I'm making sure she's doing what she's supposed to. She's doing the dishes and stuff and if she doesn't, then I'm getting mad at her. And normally that's what the, the parent does to the kid. So um, it's definitely a weird experience, but um, it, it gave me some positive and negative things, a part of my life. Like I grew up a little bit, a little bit faster. So I was more mature and I understood certain things that maybe other people my age didn't understand. But then if you look at other things, like they might do something, they might go out with friends and party. And I'm like, I don't see the point in partying because I'm, more in a mature mindset of taking care of others so um it definitely changed my childhood from from uh, other people's experiences uh near around me and my friends and such thank you so much mac uh you know you and annie have some very similar uh themes there around the role reversal that happens in this disease at a young age um and how you kind of lose some of your innocence of being a kid uh in these situations Say now, but I don't want to leave you out. Do you have anything else that you'd like to add, uh, or is that is that good? I think we can move forward. Okay. We have Great. another wee question that came through, um, so I'll put it right there, and I'll let you, Corey, um, navigate it around our wonderful panelists. Um, so, how would you approach small communities or families that have never dealt with behavioral issues? Great question. Go. Well, I was writing the answer because I was, <laughs> I was, a uh, well, I do like, uh, no, when it comes to small communities, uh, it depends. I, I imagine that since he said Ola, uh, he's from Latin America or at least Spain. Uh, when it comes to small communities in Sweden, what we have done in our organization is that we actually don't give up. We have a small, very small team who actually drives, go by train, go by bus, um, just to visit his, these families and have the clear information, both about HD in general, that there has to be a clear way of understanding HD, especially we cannot forget that HD is a very diverse disease. Uh, so symptoms varies from person to person. And same with behavioral issues. Not everyone has everything. Not everyone has behavioral issues as part of Huntington's disease, but it's good to inform them. And so they are aware, just like we have mentioned here, some have anger issues, some have irritation, apathy, and so on. And it's important to inform these families. If you are in Latin America, I've actually been in conferences, how it was working in Colombia. Uh, with the small communities, you have to travel because a lot of families don't have uh, ways of traveling to big cities, for instance, because of economical reasons or whatever. So it's good as an organization to try to not keep yourself in, this, in just a city. You have to go out, help out the families because that's, that's the way you can help them. And if they don't have computers, internet, cell phones, because in Latin America, sadly, that's a reality that exists. Um, 
it's good to at least visit those families once in a while to communicate and inform correctly about the disease so they can know that these anger problems, for instance, that they were not used to, Annie, I think we've lost your, uh, oh, you're back, you're back, great. Yeah, so that, 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 I don't know where it stopped. I'm sorry, I, the internet here is currently very bad at the moment, but yeah, that's what you're supposed to do uh, when it comes to small communities. Great, and Zainab or Mac, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, how do you kind of manage this in a small community? Um, yeah, so um, when I was about 10 years old, we moved out to a small town in St. Malo, um, and that's when my mom actually began uh, becoming symptomatic. So uh, my family has a little bit of experience with uh, uh, talking about the behavioral issues and just hunting pins in general with a small community. And uh, what, my, what my dad kind of did was, um, since we were so involved with a fundraiser going on, um, uh, in Winnipeg, uh, and we already participated, he kind of used that as a way to um, kind of meet people in the community and explain what Huntington's is. So when it comes around to September, we do fundraising for the Huntington's Indie Go-Kart Challenge in Winnipeg. So what he did was he was going door to door, knocking on doors in the community, um, saying, hey, can I just like ask for some money? We're doing a fundraiser for Huntington's disease. My wife has it. This is who I am, I'm Rolly. And he would just explain um, himself and talk about my mom and what this disease was and explain the disease and kind of explain that might see her in the community and she might look like eventually down the line, like she's almost like a drunk toddler in the store. If you see her, that's my wife, that she has Huntington's disease. And he kind of explained it that way. Um, and then just year in, year out, um, more and more people in the community started to hear about my dad. He was very open about this disease and um, on social media. So everyone was just seeing or knowing and just getting to know who he was. And when they, when, when they met Rolly, he would always just introduce my mom, like, oh, this is Teresa, my wife, she has Huntington's. And he made it like a conversation starter. And so nowadays, like I could be walking in St. Malo, I don't even live there now, but I could be walking in the store and they're like, oh, hey, you're Rolly's kid, your mom has hunting, just Huntington's disease. So um, my dad was just very open and uh, he used the fundraiser kind of as a way to meet people and explain the disease going door to door, um, to people that he never met. So um, now everyone knows who my mom is in this small little town and they know what Huntington's is. So um, yeah, just so if you're, if, if you can even start with your neighbors that way, where um, you can just go door to door, hey, this is who we are, this is our story, this is uh, whoever it is in your family that has hunting pins, you can explain it that way. So they at least have a heads up and they're not just getting all these ideas in their head, like, oh, maybe five years from now, there's someone in this yard and they look like they're drunk in public or whatever, that's not the case. It's actually this disease. So um, yeah, just be very open and honest about what's going on and uh, sharing, spreading awareness about this disease can actually uh, be beneficial and like get the community involved because now like um, every year, it seems like our fundraising for that event just goes up and up because more people want to support because they know who my mom is in that community, so. Thanks so much, Mac. Again, you know, I think adding um, a face to this disease goes a long way. Uh, in terms of people's understanding and appreciation of wanting to learn more, because it's not just something that's out there, it's actually something that's in the community. Say so now, I don't want to leave you out, um, but I'm also appreciative if, uh, if it's all been covered. So um, I don't have much to add to Anne's and Mackenzie's uh, mm. advices because they are quite relevant and important. Yes, it is about uh, sharing experience in a closed groups because sometimes stories and um, personal experience of each family is quite individual because the behavior, you know, is different. Uh, some people are very quiet. Some people are aggressive, like my father, for example. And um, yeah. 
it is very good to share experience and explain people. <laughs> awesome, that's great. So, you know, each of you have talked about your journey and kind of on the other side of it all, but if you can kind of go back into when it was really intense and, and very difficult, how did those changes affect you as a person and how did you cope with those um, feelings or uh, observations that you were having of your loved ones? Well, I can start again, just to make it easy for the other people here. Uh, I'm going to be fast so everyone has the uh, opportunity to talk. Uh, for me, the worst time was when I started being a teenager because my dad was not all, all like he was aggressive to my mom. He hit her, was very verbally abusive to her, and I had to deal with that. And at the same time, I had to deal with every kind of abuse you can say uh, with me. And it was hard because we had to call the cops various times. And there was a time where my dad even stalked me, harassing me through the phone, and, and really said some nasty things. And sadly, that caused me to have a very deep, severe depression, anxiety. I had comp I have, <laughs> what am I talking about? I still have complex PTSD because of all the trauma that has been caused and um, only because of the disease. I'm not gonna say my dad, because of the disease. And it's really rough because I, I was sent to therapy since I was eight years old because my family situation was already bad enough. And sadly in Sweden, it only like psychologists and stuff are really bad. So I'm not worse with time, uh, especially with my mental issues, and at the same time, the family situation as well. Um, it was not healthy anywhere. Like I, I didn't have a safe place at home. I was bullied at school, so life was pretty meaningless to me. But what has helped me a lot uh, has been, even though therapy has been bad, therapy is still something that has worked. Uh, but for me, it's the Swedish Huntington Organization and later on HDO, because that made me realize that I was not alone. And the aggressive part that I always thought was, oh, it only happened to my dad because no one else in the organization talked about it. Because I thought it was a normal thing you talk about, but then I realized people were actually scared to talk about it because, well, you feel shame, you feel guilt for having that in your family. So when I finally met uh, everyone at the HDO camp in Burgos and then in Kent in England, that's when I realized that I was not alone and I was receiving help from Matt and the team. And that's when everything else started like going better because I started receiving real help from neurologists and then afterwards counselors that are actually professionals who know about HD as well. Uh, as well as social workers like Corey. So it's like, it's, that's what helped me, like seeking help and finding people in the same situations, just like this Congress in general. That's like what uh, Ashley said, get, get to know each other, be friends, because you don't know how much that will actually help you. Yeah, so that is the thing that has helped me. Thank you, Annie. So again, I think, you know, the profound uh, psychological impact of, of what you went through and lived through uh, is, is real um, and it's, it's common in our families, um, but what it, the overwhelming um, uh, strategy that you used was building your little team of people to help support you, uh, including professionals as well as other youth so that you felt like you were part of a community that understood, which is great. Makrozinab, anything else to add in terms of how you uh, were affected and how you've coped? Um, yeah, like I would say definitely like um, it definitely affected me, making me more of an anxious person. Um, I definitely deal with like a lot of anxiety. I think um, that also has to do with the fact that my mom was a very anxious person. Um, so like maybe that rubbed off as well and just thinking about the role that I had with the family of being kind of like this mediator and like 
the one who stops all the fight, I kind of felt like maybe I was on edge or worried all the time because like if I'm not home and there's a fight breaking out, like my sister and my mom are in a screaming match and I'm not there to stop it, what's going to happen sort of thing. Um, so just like a lot of anxiety and like stress that kind of came on with the role that I had. Um, but I mean, it also helped me in ways to grow up faster and kind of mature and uh, learn things that maybe not all kids do at, at that age as someone dealing with a, a loved one experiencing Huntington's. Uh, so I think there's like a lot of negative and positives to take away growing up in an HD family. Like it gives you certain opportunities um, that you wouldn't have if this disease wasn't present. Um, also teaches you quite a bit early on in life that maybe you may not have a chance um, not growing up in an HD family. So. Thanks so much, Mac. So just a couple of words. Um, so when I um, relate to my uh, teenage um, time, I had a very great support of my family. We have a very big family in the East. Um, and um, so my tips of my help is uh, in teenage um, is, was my diary having a diary and uh, sports and swimming in the sea. And now when I'm care giving, uh, giving care to my sister uh, during summer month, my resources to feel, fulfill my um, resources is sports and hanging out with friends. So. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You guys have been so brave sharing your stories. Thank you. And I'm going to turn it back over to Ashley. Hi, everyone. Thank you all so, so very much for joining. That was so interesting. I hope you all enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, we now have another 15 minute break, followed by a personal story on JHD from Cheryl Sullivan on track one and a research update from Neurocrine on track two. Remember, there are booths in the exhibition hall if you want to speak with someone during the break or chat with the community in the lounge. The chat for this session has been going absolutely crazy. It is wonderful to see you all engaging and making lifelong friendships. I want to just take this opportunity to thank my wonderful host Corey and my three wonderful panellists Mackenzie, Anne Elizabeth and Zainab. Thank you all so very much for taking part and sharing your beautiful, open and honest stories. And to all of the wonderful attendees, I appreciate you all for coming along, engaging in the chat and asking your questions. Now, please head off and enjoy your break. And I look forward to seeing you all back in 15 minutes for track one and track two for some very exciting sessions. Thank you all so much and have a great rest of your day. Bye, everybody.